Section 92 of A System of Logic by John Stuart Mill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 6, Chapter 10 of the Inverse Deductive or Historical Method, Parts 6 through 8. Part 6. While the derivative laws of social statics are ascertained by analysing different states of society and comparing them with one another, without regard to the order of their succession, the consideration of the successive order is, on the contrary, predominant in the study of social dynamics, of which the aim is to observe and explain the sequences of social conditions. This branch of the social science would be as complete as it can be made if every one of the leading general circumstances of each generation were traced to its causes in the generation immediately preceding. But the consensus is so complete, especially in modern history, that in the filiation of one generation and another is this the whole which produces the whole, rather than any part a part. Little progress, therefore, can be made in establishing the filiation directly from the laws of human nature, without having first ascertained the immediate or derivative laws according to which social states generate one another as society advances, the axiomata media of general sociology. The empirical laws which are most readily obtained by generalization from history do not amount to this. They are not the middle principles themselves, but only evidence toward the establishment of such principles. They consist of certain general tendencies which may be perceived in society, a progressive increase of some social elements and diminution of others or a gradual change in the general character of certain elements. It is easily seen, for instance, that as society advances, mental tend more and more to prevail over bodily qualities, and masses over individuals, that the occupation of all that portion of mankind who are not under external restraint is at first chiefly military but society becomes progressively more and more engrossed with productive pursuits, and the military spirit gradually gives way to the industrial, to which many similar truths might be added. And with generalizations of this description, ordinary inquirers, even of the historical school now predominant on the continent, are satisfied. But these and all such results are still at too great a distance from the elementary laws of human nature on which they depend. Too many links intervene, and the concurrence of causes at each link is far too complicated to enable these propositions to be presented as direct corollaries from those elementary principles. They have, therefore, in the minds of most inquirers, remained in the state of empirical laws applicable only within the bounds of actual observation, without any means of determining their real limits, and of judging whether the changes which have hitherto been in progress are destined to continue indefinitely, or to terminate, or even to be reversed. Part 7 in order to obtain better empirical laws, we must not rest satisfied with noting the progressive changes which manifest themselves in the separate elements of society, and in which nothing is indicated but the relation of fragments of the effect to corresponding fragments of the cause. It is necessary to combine the statical view of social phenomena with the dynamical, considering not only the progressive changes of the different elements, but the contemporaneous condition of each, and thus obtain empirically the law of correspondence not only between the simultaneous states, but between the simultaneous changes of those elements. This law of correspondence it is, which, duly verified a priori, would become the real scientific derivative law of the development of humanity and human affairs. In the difficult process of observation and comparison which is here required, 
it would evidently be a great assistance if it should happen to be the fact that some one element in the complex existence of social man is preeminent over all others as the prime agent of the social movement, for we could then take the progress of that one element as the central chain to each successive link of which the corresponding links of all the other progressions being appended, the succession of the facts would by this alone be presented in a kind of spontaneous order, far more nearly approaching to the real order of their filiation than could be obtained by any other merely empirical process. Now, the evidence of history and that of human nature combine by a striking instance of consilience to show that there really is one social element which is thus predominant and almost paramount among the agents of the social progression. This is the state of the speculative faculties of mankind, including the nature of the beliefs which by any means they have arrived at, concerning themselves and the world by which they are surrounded. It would be a great error, and one very little likely to be committed, to assert that speculation, intellectual activity, the pursuit of truth, is among the more powerful propensities of human nature, or holds a predominating place in the lives of any, save decidedly exceptional, individuals. But notwithstanding the relative weakness of this principle among other sociological agents, its influence is the main determining cause of the social progress. All the other dispositions of our nature which contribute to that progress being dependent on it for the means of accomplishing their share of the work. Thus, to take the most obvious case first, the impelling force to most of the improvements effected in the arts of life is the desire of increased material comfort. But as we can only act upon external objects in proportion to our knowledge of them, the state of knowledge at any time is the limit of the industrial improvements possible at that time. And the progress of industry must follow and depend on the progress of knowledge. The same thing may be shown to be true, though it is not quite so obvious, of the progress of the fine arts. Further, as the strongest propensities of uncultivated or half-cultivated human nature being the purely selfish ones, and those of a sympathetic character which partake most of the nature of selfishness, evidently tend in themselves to disunite mankind, not to unite them, to make them rivals, not confederates. Social existence is only possible by a disciplining of those more powerful propensities which consists in subordinating them to a common system of opinions. The degree of this subordination is the measure of the completeness of the social union, and the nature of the common opinions determines its kind. But in order that mankind should conform their actions to any set of opinions, these opinions must exist, must be believed by them. And thus, the state of the speculative faculties, the character of the propositions assented to by the intellect, essentially determines the moral and political state of the community, as we have already seen that it determines the physical. These conclusions, deduced from the laws of human nature, are in entire accordance with the general facts of history. Every considerable change historically known to us in the condition of any portion of mankind, when not brought about by external force, has been preceded by a change of proportional extent in the state of their knowledge or in their prevalent beliefs. As between any given state of speculation and the correlative state of everything else, it was almost always the former which first showed itself, though the effects, no doubt, reacted potently upon the cause. Every considerable advance in material civilization has been preceded by an advance in knowledge, and when any great social change has come to pass, either in the way of gradual development or of sudden conflict, it has had for its precursor a great change in the opinions and modes of thinking of society. 
polytheism, Judaism, Christianity, Protestantism, the critical philosophy of modern Europe, and its positive science, each of these has been a primary agent in making society what it was at each successive period, while society was but secondarily instrumental in making them. Each of them, so far as causes can be assigned for its existence, being mainly an emanation not from the practical life of the period, but from the previous state of belief and thought. The weakness of the speculative propensity in mankind generally has not, therefore, prevented the progress of speculation from governing that of society at large. It has only, and too often, prevented progress altogether, where the intellectual progression has come to an early stand for want of sufficiently favourable circumstances. From this accumulated evidence, we are justified in concluding that the order of human progression in all respects will mainly depend on the order of progression in the intellectual convictions of mankind, that is, on the law of the successive transformations of human opinions. The question remains whether this law can be determined, at first from history as an empirical law, then converted into a scientific theorem by deducing it a priori from the principles of human nature. As the progress of knowledge and the changes in the opinions of mankind are very slow and manifest themselves in a well-defined manner only at long intervals, it cannot be expected that the general order of sequence should be discoverable from the examination of less than a very considerable part of the duration of the social progress. It is necessary to take into consideration the whole of past time, from the first recorded condition of the human race to the memorable phenomena of the last and present generation. Part 8. The investigation which I have thus endeavoured to characterise has been systematically attempted up to the present time by Monsieur Comte alone. His work is hitherto the only known example of the study of social phenomena according to this conception of the historical method. Without discussing here the worth of his conclusions, and especially of his predictions and recommendations with respect to the future of society, which appear to me greatly inferior in value to his appreciation of the past, I shall confine myself to mentioning one important generalization which M. Comte regards as the fundamental law of the progress of human knowledge. Speculation he conceives to have, on every subject of human inquiry, three successive stages, in the first of which it tends to explain the phenomena by supernatural agencies, in the second by metaphysical abstractions, and in the third or final state confines itself to ascertaining their laws of succession and similitude. This generalization appears to me to have that high degree of scientific evidence which is derived from the concurrence of the indications of history with the probabilities derived from the constitution of the human mind. Nor could it be easily conceived, from the mere enunciation of such a proposition, what a flood of light it lets in upon the whole course of history, when its consequences are traced, by connecting with each of the three states of human intellect which it distinguishes, and with each successive modification of those three states, the correlative condition of other social phenomena. Footnote. This great generalization is often unfavorably criticized, as by Dr. Wewell, for instance, under a misapprehension of its real import. The doctrine that the theological explanation of phenomena belongs only to the infancy of our knowledge of them, ought not to be construed as if it was equivalent to the assertion that mankind, as their knowledge advances, will necessarily cease to believe in any kind of theology. This was M. Comte's opinion, but it is by no means implied in his fundamental theorem. All that is implied is that in an advanced state of human knowledge, no other ruler of the world will be acknowledged than one who rules by universal laws and does not at all, or does not unless in very peculiar cases, 
produce events by special interpositions. Originally, all natural events were ascribed to such interpositions. At present, every educated person rejects this explanation in regard to all classes of phenomena of which the laws have been fully ascertained, though some have not yet reached the point of referring all phenomena to the idea of law, but believe that rain and sunshine, famine and pestilence, victory and defeat, death and life are issues which the Creator does not leave to the operation of his general laws, but reserves to be decided by express acts of volition. Mr. Comte's theory is the negation of this doctrine. Dr. Wewell equally misunderstands M. Comte's doctrine respecting the second or metaphysical stage of speculation. M. Comte did not mean that, quote, discussions concerning ideas, end quote, are limited to an early stage of inquiry and cease when science enters into the positive stage. Philosophy of Discovery, pages 226 and following. In all M. Comte's speculations, as much stress is laid on the process of clearing up our conceptions as on the ascertainment of facts. When M. Comte speaks of the metaphysical stage of speculation, he means the stage in which men speak of nature and other abstractions as if they were active forces producing effects. When nature is said to do this or forbid that, when nature's horror of a vacuum, nature's non-admission of a break, nature's v medicatrix were offered as explanations of phenomena, when the qualities of things were mistaken for real entities dwelling in the things, when the phenomena of living bodies were thought to be accounted for by being referred to a vital force, when, in short, the abstract names of phenomena were mistaken for the causes of their existence. In this sense of the word, it cannot be reasonably denied that the metaphysical explanation of phenomena equally with the theological gives way before the advance of real science. That the final or positive stage, as conceived by Monsieur Comte, has been equally misunderstood and that notwithstanding some expressions open to just criticism, M. Comte never dreamed of denying the legitimacy of inquiry into all causes which are accessible to human investigation, I have pointed out in a former place. End footnote. But whatever decision competent judges may pronounce on the results arrived at by any individual inquirer, the method now characterized is that by which the derivative laws of social order and of social progress must be sought. By its aid, we may hereafter succeed not only in looking far forward into the future history of the human race, but in determining what artificial means may be used, and to what extent, to accelerate the natural progress in so far as it is beneficial to compensate for whatever may be its inherent inconveniences or disadvantages, and to guard against the dangers or accidents to which our species is exposed from the necessary incidents of its progression. Such practical instructions, founded on the highest branch of speculative sociology, will form the noblest and most beneficial portion of the political art that of this science and art even the foundations are but beginning to be laid is sufficiently evident but the superior minds are fairly turning themselves toward that object it has become the aim of really scientific thinkers to connect by theories the facts of universal history it is acknowledged to be one of the requisites of a general system of social doctrine that it should explain so far as the data exist the main facts of history, and a philosophy of history is generally admitted to be at once the verification and the initial form of the philosophy of the progress of society. If the endeavours now making in all the more cultivated nations, and beginning to be made even in England, usually the last to enter into the general movement of the European mind, for the construction of a philosophy of history, 
shall be directed and controlled by those views of the nature of sociological evidence which I have, very briefly and imperfectly, attempted to characterize, they cannot fail to give birth to a sociological system widely removed from the vague and conjectural character of all former attempts, and worthy to take its place at last among the sciences. When this time shall come, no important branch of human affairs will be any longer abandoned to empiricism and unscientific surmise. The circle of human knowledge will be complete, and it can only thereafter receive further enlargement by perpetual expansion from within. End of section 92section 93 of a system of logic by john stuart mill this librivox recording is in the public domain book 6 chapter 11 additional elucidations of the science of history part 1 the doctrine which the preceding chapters were intended to enforce and elucidate that the collective series of social phenomena in other words the course of history is subject to general laws, which philosophy may possibly detect, has been familiar for generations to the scientific thinkers of the continent, and has for the last quarter of a century passed out of their peculiar domain into that of newspapers and ordinary political discussion. In our own country, however, at the time of the first publication of this treatise, it was almost a novelty and the prevailing habits of thought on historical subjects were the very reverse of a preparation for it. Since then, a great change has taken place, and has been eminently promoted by the important work of Mr. Buckle, who, with characteristic energy, flung down this great principle together with many striking exemplifications of it into the arena of popular discussion, to be fought over by a sort of combatants in the presence of a sort of spectators who would never even have been aware that there existed such a principle if they had been left to learn its existence from the speculations of pure science and hence has arisen a considerable amount of controversy tending not only to make the principle rapidly familiar to the majority of cultivated minds but also to clear it from the confusions and misunderstandings by which it was but natural that it should for a time be clouded, and which impair the worth of the doctrine to those who accept it, and are the stumbling block of many who do not. Among the impediments to the general acknowledgement by thoughtful minds of the subjection of historical facts to scientific laws, the most fundamental continues to be that which is grounded on the doctrine of free will, or, in other words, on the denial that the law of invariable causation holds true of human volitions. For if it does not, the course of history, being the result of human volitions, cannot be a subject of scientific laws, since the volitions on which it depends can neither be foreseen nor reduced to any canon of regularity even after they have occurred. I have discussed this question as far as seemed suitable to the occasion in a former chapter, and I only think it necessary to repeat that the doctrine of the causation of human actions, improperly called the doctrine of necessity, affirms no mysterious nexus or overruling fatality. It asserts only that men's actions are the joint result of the general laws and circumstances of human nature and of their own particular characters, those characters again being the consequence of the natural and artificial circumstances that constituted their education, among which circumstances must be reckoned their own conscious efforts. Anyone who is willing to take, if the expression may be permitted, the trouble of thinking himself into the doctrine as thus stated will find it, I believe, not only a faithful interpretation of the universal experience of human conduct, but a correct representation of the mode in which he himself, in every particular case, spontaneously interprets his own experience 
of that conduct. But if this principle is true of individual man, it must be true of collective man. If it is the law of human life, the law must be realized in history. The experience of human affairs when looked at en masse must be in accordance with it if true or repugnant to it if false. The support which this a posteriori verification accords to the law is part of the case which has been most clearly and triumphantly brought out by Mr. Buckle. The facts of statistics, since they have been made a subject of careful recordation and study, have yielded conclusions, some of which have been very startling to persons not accustomed to regard moral actions as subject to uniform laws. The very events which in their own nature appear most capricious and uncertain, and which in any individual cause no attainable degree of knowledge, would enable us to foresee occur when considerable numbers are taken into account with a degree of regularity approaching to mathematical. What act is there which all would consider as more completely dependent on individual character and on the exercise of individual free will than that of slaying a fellow creature? Yet in any large country the number of murderers in proportion to the population varies, it has been found, very little from one year to another, and in its variations never deviates widely from a certain average. What is still more remarkable, there is a similar approach to constancy in the proportion of these murders annually committed with every particular kind of instrument. There is a like approximation to identity as between one year and another in the comparative number of legitimate and of illegitimate births. The same thing is found true of suicides, accidents, and all other social phenomena of which the registration is sufficiently perfect. One of the most curiously illustrative examples being the fact, ascertained by the registers of the London and Paris post offices, that the number of letters posted, which the writers have forgotten to direct, is nearly the same in proportion to the whole number of letters posted in one year as in another. Quote, year after year, says Mr. Buckle, the same proportion of letter writers forget this simple act, so that for each successive period we can actually foretell the number of persons whose memory will fail them in regard to this trifling and, as it might appear, accidental occurrence. End quote. Footnote. Buckles, History of Civilization, Volume 1, page 30. End footnote. This singular degree of regularity en masse, combined with the extreme of irregularity in the cases composing the mass, is a felicitous verification a posteriori of the law of causation in its application to human conduct. Assuming the truth of that law, Every human action, every murder, for instance, is the concurrent result of two sets of causes. On the one part, the general circumstances of the country and its inhabitants, the moral, educational, economical, and other influences operating on the whole people and constituting what we term the state of civilization. On the other part, the great variety of influences special to the individual, his temperament and other peculiarities of organization, his parentage, habitual associates, temptations, and so forth. If we now take the whole of the instances which occur within a sufficiently large field to exhaust all the combinations of these special influences, or, in other words, to eliminate chance, and if all these instances have occurred within such narrow limits of time that no material change can have taken place in the general influences constituting the state of civilization of the country, we may be certain that if human actions are governed by invariable laws, the aggregate result will be something like a constant quantity. The number of murders committed within that space and time 
being the effect partly of general causes which have not varied, and partly of partial causes, the whole round of whose variations has been included, will be, practically speaking, invariable. Literally and mathematically invariable it is not, and could not be expected to be, because the period of a year is too short to include all the possible combinations of partial courses, while it is, at the same time, sufficiently long to make it probable that in some years at least of every series there will have been introduced new influences of a more or less general character, such as a more vigorous or a more relaxed police, some temporary excitement from political or religious causes, or some incident generally notorious of a nature to act morbidly on the imagination, that in spite of these unavoidable imperfections in the data, there should be so very trifling a margin of variation in the annual results, is a brilliant continuation of the general theory. Part 2. The same considerations which thus strikingly corroborate the evidence of the doctrine that historical facts are the invariable effects of causes, tend equally to clear that doctrine from various misapprehensions, the existence of which has been put in evidence by the recent discussions. Some persons, for instance, seemingly imagine the doctrine to imply not merely that the total number of murders committed in a given space and time is entirely the effect of the general circumstances of society, but that every particular murder is so too, that the individual murderer is, so to speak, a mere instrument in the hands of general causes that he himself has no option, or, if he has and chose to exercise it, someone else would be necessitated to take his place, that if any one of the actual murderers had abstained from the crime, some person who would otherwise have remained innocent would have committed an extra murder to make up the average such a corollary would certainly convict any theory which necessarily led to it of absurdity. It is obvious, however, that each particular murder depends not on the general state of society only, but on that combined with causes special to the case, which are generally much more powerful. And if these special causes, which have greater influence than the general ones in causing every particular murder, have no influence on the number of murders in a given period, it is because the field of observation is so extensive as to include all possible combinations of the special causes, all varieties of individual character and individual temptation compatible with the general state of society. The collective experiment, as it may be termed, exactly separates the effect of the general from that of the special causes, and shows the net result of the former, but it declares nothing at all respecting the amount of influence of the special causes, be it greater or smaller, since the scale of the experiment extends to the number of cases within which the effects of the special causes balance one another, and disappear in that of the general causes. I will not pretend that all the defenders of the theory have always kept their language free from this same confusion, and have shown no tendency to exalt the influence of general causes at the expense of special. I am of opinion, on the contrary, that they have done so in a very great degree, and by so doing have encumbered their theory with difficulties and laid it open to objections which do not necessarily affect it. Some, for example, among whom is Mr. Buckle himself, have inferred or allowed it to be supposed that they inferred from the regularity and the recurrence of events which depend on moral qualities that the moral qualities of mankind are little capable of being improved or are of little importance in the general progress of society compared with intellectual or economic causes. But to draw this inference is to forget that the statistical tables from which the invariable averages are deduced were compiled from facts occurring within narrow geographical limits 
and in a small number of successive years, that is, from a field the whole of which was under the operation of the same general causes, and during too short a time to allow of much change therein. All moral causes but those common to the country generally have been eliminated by the great number of instances taken, and those which are common to the whole country have not varied considerably in the short space of time comprised in the observations. If we admit the supposition that they have varied, if we compare one age with another, or one country with another, or even one part of a country with another, differing in position and character as to the moral elements, the crimes committed within a year give no longer the same but a widely different numerical aggregate. And this cannot but be the case, for, inasmuch as every single crime committed by an individual mainly depends on his moral qualities, the crimes committed by the entire population of the country must depend in an equal degree on their collective moral qualities. To render this element inoperative upon the large scale, it would be necessary to suppose that the general moral average of mankind does not vary from country to country or from age to age, which is not true, and, even if it were true, could not possibly be proved by any existing statistics. I do not on this account the less agree in the opinion of Mr. Buckle that the intellectual element in mankind, including in that expression the nature of their beliefs, the amount of their knowledge, and the development of their intelligence, is the predominant circumstance in determining their progress. But I am of this opinion not because I regard their moral or economical condition either as less powerful or less variable agencies, but because these are in a great degree the consequences of the intellectual condition, and are in all cases limited by it, as was observed in the preceding chapter. The intellectual changes are the most conspicuous agents in history, not from their superior force considered in themselves, but because practically they work with the united power belonging to all three. Footnote. I have been assured by an intimate friend of Mr. Buckle that he would not have withheld his assent from these remarks, and that he never intended to affirm or imply that mankind are not progressive in their moral as well as in their intellectual qualities. Quote, in dealing with his problem, he availed himself of the artifice resorted to by the political economist, who leaves out of consideration the generous and benevolent sentiments, and founds his science on the proposition that mankind are actuated by acquisitive propensities alone. End quote. Not because such is the fact, but because it is necessary to begin by treating the principal influence as if it was the sole one, and make due corrections afterward. Quote, he desired to make abstractions of the intellect as the determining and dynamical element of the progression, eliminating the more dependent set of conditions, and treating the more active one as if it were an entirely independent variable. End quote. The same friend of Mr. Buckle states, that when he used expressions which seemed to exaggerate the influence of general at the expense of special causes, and especially at the expense of the influence of individual minds, Mr. Buckle really intended no more than to affirm emphatically that the greatest men cannot effect great changes in human affairs unless the general mind has been in some considerable degree prepared for them, by the general circumstances of the age, a truth which, of course, no one thinks of denying, and there certainly are passages in Mr. Buckle's writings which speak of the influence exercised by great individual intellects in as strong terms as could be desired. End footnote. Part 3. There is another distinction often neglected in the discussion of this subject, which it is extremely important to observe. The theory of the subjection of social progress to invariable laws is often held in conjunction with the doctrine. 
that social progress cannot be materially influenced by the exertions of individual persons or by the acts of governments. But though these opinions are often held by the same persons, they are two very different opinions, and the confusion between them is the eternally recurring error of confounding causation with fatalism. Because whatever happens will be the effect of causes, human volitions among the rest. It does not follow that volitions, even those of peculiar individuals, are not of great efficacy as causes. If any one in a storm at sea, because about the same number of persons in every year perish by shipwreck, should conclude that it was useless for him to attempt to save his own life, we should call him a fatalist, and should remind him that the efforts of shipwrecked persons to save their lives are so far from being immaterial, that the average amount of these efforts is one of the causes on which the ascertained annual number of deaths by shipwreck depend. However universal the laws of social development may be, they cannot be more universal or more rigorous than those of the physical agencies of nature. Yet human will can convert these into instruments of its designs, and the extent to which it does so makes the chief difference between savages and the most highly civilized people. Human and social facts, from their more complicated nature, are not less but more modifiable than mechanical and chemical facts. Human agency, therefore, has still greater power over them. And accordingly, those who maintain that the evolution of society depends exclusively, or almost exclusively, on general causes, always include among these the collective knowledge and intellectual development of the race. But if of the race, why not also of some powerful monarch or thinker, or of the ruling portion of some political society acting through its government? Though the varieties of character among ordinary individuals neutralize one another on any large scale, exceptional individuals in important positions do not in any given age neutralize one another. There was not another Thermistocles or Luther or Julius Caesar of equal powers and contrary dispositions who exactly balanced the given Themistocles, Luther and Caesar and prevented them from having any permanent effect. Moreover, for aught that appears, the volitions of exceptional persons, or the opinions and purposes of the individuals who at some particular time compose a government, may be indispensable links in the chain of causation by which even the general causes produce their effects. And I believe this to be the only tenable form of the theory. Lord Macaulay, in a celebrated passage of one of his early essays, let me add that it was one which he did not himself choose to reprint, gives expression to the doctrine of the absolute inoperativeness of great men, more unqualified, I should think, than has been given to it by any writer of equal abilities. He compares them to persons who merely stand on a loftier height, and thence receive the sun's rays a little earlier, than the rest of the human race. Quote, the sun illuminates the hills while it is still below the horizon, and truth is discovered by the highest minds a little before it becomes manifest to the multitude. This is the extent of their superiority. They are the first to catch and reflect a light which, without their assistance, must in a short time be visible to those who lie far beneath them. End quote. Footnote. Essay on Dryden in Miscellaneous Writings. Volume 1, page 186. End footnote. If this metaphor is to be carried out, it follows that if there had been no Newton, the world would not only have had the Newtonian system, but would have had it equally soon, as the sun would have risen just as early to spectators in the plain, if there had been no mountain at hand to catch still earlier rays. And so it would be, if truths, like the sun, rose by their own proper motion without human effort. 
but not otherwise. I believe that if Newton had not lived, the world must have waited for the Newtonian philosophy until there had been another Newton or his equivalent. No ordinary man and no succession of ordinary men could have achieved it. I will not go the length of saying that what Newton did in a single life might not have been done in successive steps by some of those who followed him, each singly inferior to him in genius. But even the least of those steps required a man of great intellectual superiority. Eminent men do not merely see the coming light from the hilltop, they mount on the hilltop and evoke it. And if no one had ever ascended thither, the light, in many cases, might never have risen upon the plain at all. Philosophy and religion are abundantly amenable to general causes, yet few will doubt that, had there been no Socrates, no Plato, and no Aristotle, there would have been no philosophy for the next two thousand years, nor, in all probability, then, and that if there had been no Christ and no St. Paul, there would have been no Christianity. The point in which, above all, the influence of remarkable individuals is decisive is in determining the celerity of the movement. In most states of society, it is the existence of great men which decides even whether there shall be any progress. It is conceivable that Greece or that Christian Europe might have been progressive in certain periods of their history through general causes only. But if there had been no Mohammed, would Arabia have produced Avicenna or Averroes, or caliphs of Baghdad or of Cordova? In determining, however, in what manner and order the progress of mankind shall take place if it take place at all, much less depends on the character of individuals. There is a sort of necessity established in this respect by the general laws of human nature, by the constitution of the human mind. Certain truths cannot be discovered nor inventions made unless certain others have been made first. Certain social improvements from the nature of the case can only follow and not precede others. The order of human progress, therefore, may to a certain extent have definite laws assigned to it, while, as to its celerity, or even as to its taking place at all, no generalization extending to the human species generally can possibly be made, but only some very precarious approximate generalizations confined to the small portion of mankind in whom there has been anything like consecutive progress within the historical period, and deduced from their special position or collected from their particular history. Even looking to the manner of progress, the order of succession of social states, there is need of great flexibility in our generalizations. The limits of variation in the possible development of social as of animal life are a subject of which little is yet understood and are one of the great problems in social science. It is, at all events, a fact that different portions of mankind under the influence of different circumstances have developed themselves in a more or less different manner and into different forms. And among these determining circumstances, the individual character of their great speculative thinkers or practical organizers may well have been one. Who can tell how profoundly the whole subsequent history of China may have been influenced by the individuality of Confucius and of Sparta, and hence of Greece and the world, by that of Lycurgus? Concerning the nature and extent of what a great man under favorable circumstances can do for mankind, as well as of what a government can do for a nation, many different opinions are possible. And every shade of opinion on these points is consistent with the fullest recognition that there are invariable laws of historical phenomena. Of course, the degree of influence which has to be assigned to these more special agencies 
makes a great difference in the precision which can be given to the general laws and in the confidence with which predictions can be grounded on them. Whatever depends on the peculiarities of individuals, combined with the accident of the positions they hold, is necessarily incapable of being foreseen. Undoubtedly, these casual combinations might be eliminated like any others, by taking sufficiently large cycle. The peculiarities of a great historical character make their influence felt in history sometimes for several thousand years, but it is highly probable that they will make no difference at all at the end of fifty millions. Since, however, we cannot obtain an average of the vast length of time necessary to exhaust all the possible combinations of great men and circumstances, as much of the law of evolution of human affairs as depends upon this average is and remains inaccessible to us. And within the next thousand years, which are of considerably more importance to us than the whole remainder of the fifty millions, the favourable and unfavourable combinations which will occur will be to us purely accidental. We cannot foresee the advent of great men. Those who introduce new speculative thoughts or great practical conceptions into the world cannot have their epoch fixed beforehand. What science can do is this. It can trace through past history the general causes which had brought mankind into that preliminary state which, when the right sort of great man appeared, rendered them accessible to his influence. If this state continues, experience renders it tolerably certain that in a longer or shorter period the great man will be produced, provided that the general circumstances of the country and people are, which very often they are not, compatible with his existence, of which point also science can in some measure judge. It is in this manner that the results of progress except as to the celerity of their production, can be, to a certain extent, reduced to regularity and law. And the belief that they can be so is equally consistent with assigning very great or very little efficacy to the influence of exceptional men or of the acts of governments. And the same may be said of all other accidents and disturbing causes. Part 4. It would nevertheless be a great error to assign only a trifling importance to the agency of eminent individuals or of governments. It must not be concluded that the influence of either is small, because they cannot bestow what the general circumstances of society and the course of its previous history have not prepared it to receive. Neither thinkers nor governments effect all that they intend, but in compensation they often produce important results which they did not in the least foresee. Great men and great actions are seldom wasted. They send forth a thousand unseen influences more effective than those which are seen, and though nine out of every ten things done with a good purpose by those who are in advance of their age produce no material effect, the tenth thing produces effects twenty times as great as any one would have dreamed of predicting from it. Even the men who for want of sufficiently favourable circumstances left no impress at all upon their own age, have often been of the greatest value to posterity. Who could appear to have lived more entirely in vain than some of the early heretics? They were burned or massacred, their writings extirpated, their memory anathematized, and their very names and existence left for seven or eight centuries in the obscurity of musty manuscripts, their history to be gathered, perhaps, only from the sentences by which they were condemned. Yet the memory of these men, men who resisted certain pretensions of certain dogmas of the Church in the very age in which the unanimous assent of Christendom was afterward claimed as having been given to them, and asserted as the ground of their authority, broke the chain of tradition, established a series of precedents for resistance, 
inspired later reformers with the courage and armed them with the weapons which they needed when mankind were better prepared to follow their impulse. To this example from men, let us add another from governments. The comparatively enlightened rule of which Spain had the benefit during a considerable part of the 18th century did not correct the fundamental defects of the Spanish people, and in consequence, though it did great temporary good, so much of that good perished with it, that it may plausibly be affirmed to have had no permanent effect. The case has been cited as a proof how little governments can do in opposition to the causes which have determined the general character of the nation. It does show how much there is which they can not do, but not that they can do nothing. Compare what Spain was at the beginning of that half-century of liberal government with what she had become at its close. That period fairly let in the light of European thought upon the more educated classes, and it never afterward ceased to go on spreading. Previous to that time, the change was in an inverse direction. Culture, light, intellectual and even material activity were becoming extinguished. Was it nothing to arrest this downward and convert it into an upward course? How much that Charles III and Aranda could not do had been the ultimate consequence of what they did. To that half-century Spain owes that she has got rid of the Inquisition, that she has got rid of the monks, that she now has parliaments and, save in exceptional intervals, a free press, and the feelings of freedom and citizenship, and is acquiring railroads and all other constituents of material and economical progress. In the Spain which preceded that era, there was not a single element at work which could have led to these results in any length of time, if the country had continued to be governed as it was by the last princes of the Austrian dynasty, or if the Bourbon rulers had been from the first what, both in Spain and Naples, they afterward became. And if a government can do much, even when it seems to have done little in causing positive improvement, still greater are the issues dependent on it in the way of warding off evils, both internal and external, which else would stop improvement altogether. A good or a bad councillor in a single city at a particular crisis has affected the whole subsequent fate of the world. It is as certain as any contingent judgment respecting historical events can be, that if there had been no Themistocles, there would have been no victory of Salamis. And had there not, where would have been all our civilization? How different again would have been the issue if Epaminondas or Timoleon or even Ifricrates, instead of Charles and Lysicles, had commanded at Caronia. As is well said in the second of two essays on the study of history, in my judgment the soundest and most philosophical productions which the recent controversies on this subject have called forth, historical science authorizes not absolute, but only conditional predictions. Footnote in the Cornhill Magazine for June and July 1861. End footnote. General causes count for much, but individuals also, quote, produce great changes in history and colour its whole complexion long after their death. No one can doubt that the Roman Republic would have subsided into a military despotism if Julius Caesar had never lived. Thus much was rendered practically certain by general causes. But is it at all clear that in that case Gaul would ever have formed a province of the empire? Might not Varus have lost his three legions on the banks of the Rhone? And might not that river have become the frontier instead of the Rhine? This might well have happened if Caesar and Crassus had changed provinces and it is surely impossible to say that in such an event the venue, as lawyers say, 
of European civilization might not have been changed. The Norman conquest in the same way was as much the act of a single man as the writing of a newspaper article, and knowing, as we do, the history of that man and his family, we can retrospectively predict with all but infallible certainty that no other person, no other in that age, I presume is meant, could have accomplished the enterprise. If it had not been accomplished, is there any ground to suppose that either our history or our national character would have been what they are? End quote. As is most truly remarked by the same writer, the whole stream of Grecian history, as cleared up by Mr. Grote, is one series of examples how often events on which the whole destiny of subsequent civilization turned were dependent on the personal character for good or evil of some one individual. It must be said, however, that Greece furnishes the most extreme example of this nature to be found in history, and is a very exaggerated specimen of the general tendency. It has happened only that once, and will probably never happen again, that the fortunes of mankind depended upon keeping a certain order of things in existence in a single town, or a country scarcely larger than Yorkshire, capable of being ruined or saved by a hundred causes of very slight magnitude in comparison with the general tendencies of human affairs. Neither ordinary accidents nor the characters of individuals can ever again be so vitally important as they then were. The longer our species lasts, and the more civilized it becomes, the more, as Comte remarks, does the influence of past generations over the present, and of mankind en masse over every individual in it, predominate over other forces. And though the course of affairs never ceases to be susceptible of alteration both by accidents and by personal qualities, the increasing preponderance of the collective agency of the species over all minor causes is constantly bringing the general evolution of the race into something which deviates less from a certain and pre-appointed track. Historical science, therefore, is always becoming more possible not solely because it is better studied, but because, in every generation, it becomes better adapted for study. End of section 93。section 94 of A System of Logic by John Stuart Mill。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。book 6, chapter 12 of the logic of practice or art, including morality and policy. Part 1. In the preceding chapters, we have endeavoured to characterise the present state of those among the branches of knowledge called moral, which are sciences only in the proper sense of the term, that is, inquiries into the course of nature. It is customary, however, to include under the term moral knowledge, and even, though improperly, under that of moral science, an inquiry the results of which do not express themselves in the indicative, but in the imperative mood, or, in periphrases equivalent to it, what is called the knowledge of duties, practical ethics, or morality. Now, the imperative mood is the characteristic of art as distinguished from science. Whatever speaks in rules or precepts not in assertions respecting matters of fact, is art. And ethics or morality is properly a portion of the art corresponding to the sciences of human nature and society. Footnote. It is almost superfluous to observe that there is another meaning of the word art, in which it may be said to denote the poetical department or aspect of things in general, in contradistinction to the scientific. In the text, the word is used in its older and, I hope, not yet obsolete sense. End footnote. The method, therefore, of ethics can be no other than that of art or practice in general, 
and the portion yet uncompleted of the task which we propose to ourselves in the concluding book is to characterize the general method of art as distinguished from science. Part 2. In all branches of practical business there are cases in which individuals are bound to conform their practice to a pre-established rule, while there are others in which it is part of their task to find or construct the rule by which they are to govern their conduct. The first, for example, is the case of a judge under a definite written code. The judge is not called upon to determine what course would be intrinsically the most advisable in the particular case in hand, but only within what rule of law it falls, what the legislature has ordained to be done in the kind of case, and must therefore be presumed to have intended in the individual case. The method must here be wholly and exclusively one of ratiocination or syllogism, and the process is obviously what in our analysis of the syllogism we showed that all ratiocination is, namely, the interpretation of a formula. In order that our illustration of the opposite case may be taken from the same class of subjects as the former, we will suppose, in contrast with the situation of the judge, the position of the legislator. As the judge has laws for his guidance, so the legislator has rules and maxims of policy. But it would be a manifest error to suppose that the legislator is bound by these maxims in the same manner as the judge is bound by the laws, and that all he has to do is to argue down from them to the particular case, as the judge does from the laws. The legislator is bound to take into consideration the reasons or grounds of the maxim. The judge has nothing to do with those of the law, except so far as a consideration of them may throw light upon the intention of the lawmaker, where his words have left it doubtful. To the judge, the rule, once positively ascertained, is final. But the legislator or other practitioner who goes by rules rather than by their reasons, like the old-fashioned German tacticians who were vanquished by Napoleon, or the physician who preferred that his patient should die by rule rather than recover contrary to it, is rightly judged to be a mere pedant and the slave of his formulas. Now, the reasons of a maxim of policy or any other rule of art can be no other than the theorems of the corresponding science. The relation in which rules of art stand to doctrines of science may thus be characterized. The art proposes to itself an end to be attained, defines the end, and hands it over to the science. The science receives it, considers it as a phenomenon or effect to be studied, and having investigated its causes and conditions, sends it back to art with a theorem of the combination of circumstances by which it could be produced. Art then examines these combinations of circumstances, and according as any of them are or are not in human power, pronounces the end attainable or not. The only one of the premises, therefore, which art supplies is the original major premise which asserts that the attainment of the given end is desirable. Science, then, lends to art the proposition obtained by a series of inductions or of deductions that the performance of certain actions will attain the end. From these premises, art concludes that the performance of these actions is desirable, and finding it also practicable, converts the theorem into a rule or precept. Part 3. It deserves particular notice that the theorem or speculative truth is not ripe for being turned into a precept until the whole, and not a part merely, of the operation which belongs to science has been performed. Suppose that we have completed the scientific process only up to a certain point, have discovered that a particular cause will produce the desired effect but have not ascertained all the negative conditions which are necessary, that is, 
all the circumstances which, if present, would prevent its production. If, in this imperfect state of the scientific theory, we attempt to frame a rule of art, we perform that operation prematurely. Whenever any counteracting cause overlooked by the theorem takes place, the rule will be at fault. We shall employ the means, and the end will not follow. No arguing from or about the rule itself will then help us through the difficulty. There is nothing for it but to turn back and finish the scientific process which should have preceded the formation of the rule. We must reopen the investigation to inquire into the remainder of the conditions on which the effect depends, and only after we have ascertained the whole of these are we prepared to transform the completed law of the effect into a precept in which those circumstances or combinations of circumstances which the science exhibits as conditions are prescribed as means. It is true that, for the sake of convenience, rules must be formed from something less than this ideally perfect theory in the first place, because the theory can seldom be made ideally perfect and next because, if all the counteracting contingencies, whether of frequent or of rare occurrence, were included, the rules would be too cumbrous to be apprehended and remembered by ordinary capacities on the common occasions of life. The rules of art do not attempt to comprise more conditions than require to be attended to in ordinary cases, and are therefore always imperfect. In the manual arts, where the requisite conditions are not numerous, and where those which the rules do not specify are generally either plain to common observation or speedily learned from practice, rules may often be safely acted on by persons who know nothing more than the rule. But in the complicated affairs of life, and still more in those of states and societies, rules cannot be relied on without constantly referring back to the scientific laws on which they are founded. To know what are the practical contingencies which require a modification of the rule, or which are altogether exceptions to it, is to know what combinations of circumstances would interfere with, or entirely counteract, the consequences of those law. And this can only be learned by a reference to the theoretic grounds of the rule. By a wise practitioner, therefore, rules of conduct will only be considered as provisional, being made for the most numerous cases or for those of most ordinary occurrence, they point out the manner in which it will be least perilous to act, where time or means do not exist for analysing the actual circumstances of the case or where we cannot trust our judgment in estimating them but they do not at all supersede the propriety of going through, when circumstances permit, the scientific process requisite for framing a rule from the data of the particular case before us. At the same time, the common rule may very properly serve as an admonition that a certain mode of action has been found by ourselves and others to be well adapted to the cases of most common occurrence so that if it be unsuitable to the case in hand, the reason of its being so will be likely to arise from some unusual circumstance. Part 4. The error is therefore apparent of those who would deduce the line of conduct proper to particular cases from supposed universal practical maxims, overlooking the necessity of constantly referring back to the principles of the speculative science in order to be sure of attaining even the specific end which the rules have in view. How much greater still, then, must the error be of setting up such unbending principles, not merely as universal rules for attaining a given end, but as rules of conduct generally, without regard to the possibility, not only that some modifying cause may prevent the attainment of the given end by the means which the rule prescribes, but that success itself may conflict with some other end, which may possibly chance to be more desirable. This is the habitual error of many of the political speculators whom I have characterized as the geometrical school, 
especially in France, where ratiocination from rules of practice forms the staple commodity of journalism and political oratory, a misapprehension of the functions of deduction which has brought much discredit in the estimation of other countries upon the spirit of generalization so honorably characteristic of the French mind. The commonplaces of politics in France are large and sweeping practical maxims from which, as ultimate premises, men reason downward to particular applications, and this they call being logical and consistent. For instance, they are perpetually arguing that such and such a measure ought to be adopted because it is a consequence of the principle on which the form of government is founded, of the principle of legitimacy or the principle of the sovereignty of the people, to which it may be answered that if these be really practical principles, they must rest on speculative grounds. The sovereignty of the people, for example, must be a right foundation for government, because a government thus constituted tends to produce certain beneficial effects. Inasmuch, however, as no government produces all possible beneficial effects, but all are attended with more or fewer inconveniences, and since these cannot usually be combated by means drawn from the very causes which produce them, it would be often a much stronger recommendation of some practical arrangement that it does not follow from what is called the general principle of the government than that it does. Under a government of legitimacy, the presumption is far rather in favour of institutions of popular origin, and in a democracy in favour of arrangements tending to check the impetus of popular will. The line of augmentation so commonly mistaken in France for political philosophy tends to the practical conclusion that we should exert our utmost efforts to aggravate instead of alleviating whatever are the characteristic imperfections of the system of institutions which we prefer or under which we happen to live. Part 5. The grounds, then, of every rule of art are to be found in the theorems of science. An art, or a body of art, consists of the rules together with as much of the speculative propositions as comprises the justification of those rules. The complete art of any matter includes a selection of such a portion from the science as is necessary to show on what conditions the effects which the art aims at producing depend and art in general consists of the truths of science, arranged in the most convenient order for practice, instead of the order which is the most convenient for thought. Science groups and arranges its truths so as to enable us to take in at one view as much as possible of the general order of the universe. Art, though it must assume the same general laws, follows them only into such of their detailed consequences as have led to the formation of rules of conduct, and brings together from parts of the field of science most remote from one another the truths relating to the production of the different and heterogeneous conditions necessary to each effect which the exigencies of practical life require to be produced. Footnote. Professor Bain and others call the selection from the truths of science made for the purposes of an art a practical science, and confine the name art to the actual rules. End footnote. Science, therefore, following one cause to its various effects, while art traces one effect to its multiplied and diversified causes and conditions, there is a need of a set of intermediate scientific truths derived from the higher generalities of science and destined to serve as the generalia or first principles of the various arts. The scientific operation of framing these intermediate principles Monsieur Comte characterizes as one of those results of philosophy which are reserved for futurity. The only complete example which he points out as actually realized and which can be held up as a type to be imitated in more important matters, 
is the general theory of the art of descriptive geometry as conceived by Monsieur Mong. It is not, however, difficult to understand what the nature of these intermediate principles must generally be. After framing the most comprehensive possible conception of the end to be aimed at, that is, of the effect to be produced, and determining in the same comprehensive manner the set of conditions on which that effect depends, there remains to be taken a general survey of the resources which can be commanded for realizing this set of conditions. And when the result of this survey has been embodied in the fewest and most extensive propositions possible, those propositions will express the general relation between the available means and the end, and will constitute the general scientific theory of the art, from which its practical methods will follow as corollaries. Part 6. But though the reasonings which connect the end or purpose of every art with its means belonging to the domain of science, the definition of the end itself belongs exclusively to art and forms its peculiar province. Every art has one first principle or general major premise not borrowed from science, that which enunciates the object aimed at and affirms it to be a desirable object. The builder's art assumes that it is desirable to have buildings. Architecture, as one of the fine arts, that it is desirable to have them beautiful or imposing. The hygienic and medical arts assume, the one, that the preservation of health, the other, that the cure of disease, are fitting and desirable ends. These are not propositions of science. Propositions of science assert a matter of fact an existence, a coexistence, a succession, or a resemblance. The propositions now spoken of do not assert that anything is, but enjoin or recommend that something should be. They are a class by themselves. A proposition of which the predicate is expressed by the words ought or should be is generically different from one which is expressed by is or will be. It is true that in the largest sense of the words, even these propositions assert something as a matter of fact. The fact affirmed in them is that the conduct recommended excites in the speaker's mind the feeling of approbation. This, however, does not go to the bottom of the matter, for the speaker's approbation is no sufficient reason why other people should approve nor ought it to be a conclusive reason even with himself. For the purposes of practice, every one must be required to justify his approbation, and for this there is need of general premises, determining what are the proper objects of approbation, and what the proper order of precedence among those objects. These general premises, together with the principal conclusions which may be deduced from them, form, or rather might form, a body of doctrine which is properly the art of life, in its three departments, morality, prudence or policy, and aesthetics. The right, the expedient, and the beautiful or noble in human conduct and works. To this art, which in the main is unfortunately still to be created, all other arts are subordinate, since its principles are those which must determine whether the special aim of any particular art is worthy and desirable, and what is its place in the scale of desirable things. Every art is thus a joint result of laws of nature disclosed by science, and of the general principles of what has been called teleology, or the doctrine of ends, which, borrowing the language of the German metaphysicians, may also be termed, not improperly, the principles of practical reason. Footnote. The word teleology is also, but inconveniently and improperly, employed by some writers as a name for the attempt to explain the phenomena of the universe from final causes. End footnote. A scientific observer or reasoner, merely as such, is not an advisor for practice, 
His part is only to show that certain consequences follow from certain causes, and that to obtain certain ends, certain means are the most effectual. Whether the ends themselves are such as ought to be pursued, and if so, in what cases and to how great a length, it is no part of his business as a cultivator of science to decide, and science alone will never qualify him for the decision. In purely physical science, there is not much temptation to assume this ulterior office. But those who treat of human nature and society invariably claim it. They always undertake to say not merely what is, but what ought to be. To entitle them to do this, a complete doctrine of teleology is indispensable. A scientific theory, however perfect, of the subject matter, considered merely as part of the order of nature, can in no degree serve as a substitute. In this respect, the various subordinate arts afford a misleading analogy. In them, there is seldom any visible necessity for justifying the end, since, in general, its desirableness is denied by nobody and it is only when the question of precedence is to be decided between that end and some other that the general principles of teleology have to be called in. But a writer on morals and politics requires those principles at every step. The most elaborate and well-digested exposition of the laws of succession and coexistence among mental or social phenomena and of their relation to one another as causes and effects, will be of no avail toward the art of life or of society, if the ends to be aimed at by that art are left to the vague suggestions of the intellectus sibi permissus, or are taken for granted without analysing or questioning. Part 7. There is, then, a philosophia prima peculiar to art, as there is one which belongs to science. There are not only first principles of knowledge, but first principles of conduct. There must be some standard by which to determine the goodness or badness, absolute and comparative, of ends or objects of desire. And whatever that standard is, there can be but one. For if there were several ultimate principles of conduct, the same conduct might be approved by one of those principles and condemned by another, and there would be needed some more general principle as umpire between them. Accordingly, writers on moral philosophy have mostly felt the necessity not only of referring all rules of conduct and all judgments of praise and blame to principles, but of referring them to some one principle some rule or standard with which all other rules of conduct were required to be consistent and from which by ultimate consequence they could all be deduced those who have dispensed with the assumption of such a universal standard have only been enabled to do so by supposing that a moral sense or instinct inherent in our constitution informs us both what principles of conduct we are bound to observe, and also in what order these should be subordinated to one another. The theory of the foundations of morality is a subject which it would be out of place in a work like this to discuss at large, and which could not to any useful purpose be treated incidentally. I shall content myself, therefore, with saying that the doctrine of intuitive moral principles, even if true, would provide only for that portion of the field of conduct which is properly called moral. For the remainder of the practice of life, some general principle or standard must still be sought. And if that principle be rightly chosen, it will be found, I apprehend, to serve quite as well for the ultimate principle of morality as for that of prudence policy, or taste. Without attempting in this place to justify my opinion, or even to define the kind of justification which it admits of, I merely declare my conviction that the general principle to which all rules of practice ought to conform 
and the test by which they should be tried is that of conduciveness to the happiness of mankind, or rather of all sentient beings. In other words, that the promotion of happiness is the ultimate principle of teleology. Footnote. For an express discussion and vindication of this principle, see the little volume entitled Utilitarianism. End footnote. I do not mean to assert that the promotion of happiness should be itself the end of all actions, or even of all rules of action. It is the justification and ought to be the controller of all ends, but it is not itself the sole end. There are many virtuous actions and even virtuous modes of action, though the cases are, I think, less frequent than is often supposed, by which happiness in the particular instance is sacrificed, more pain being produced than pleasure. But conduct of which this can be truly asserted admits of justification only because it can be shown that, on the whole, more happiness will exist in the world if feelings are cultivated which will make people in certain cases regardless of happiness. I fully admit that this is true that the cultivation of an ideal nobleness of will and conduct should be to individual human beings an end to which the specific pursuit either of their own happiness or of that of others, except so far as included in that idea, should in any case of conflict give way. But I hold that the very question what constitutes this elevation of character is itself to be decided by a reference to happiness as the standard. The character itself should be, to the individual, a paramount end, simply because the existence of this ideal nobleness of character, or of a near approach to it in any abundance, would go farther than all things else toward making human life happy, both in the comparatively humble sense of pleasure and freedom from pain, and in the higher meaning of rendering life, not what it now is almost universally puerile and insignificant, but such as human beings with highly developed faculties can care to have. Part 8. With these remarks we must close this summary view of the application of the general logic of scientific inquiry to the moral and social departments of science. Notwithstanding the extreme generality of the principles of method which I have laid down, a generality which I trust is not in this instance synonymous with vagueness, I have indulged the hope that to some of those on whom the task will devolve of bringing those most important of all sciences into a more satisfactory state, these observations may be useful, both in removing erroneous and in clearing up the true conceptions of the means by which, on subjects of so high a degree of complication, truth can be attained. Should this hope be realised, what is probably destined to be the greatest intellectual achievement of the next two or three generations of European thinkers will have been in some degree forwarded. The End End of section 94 End of A System of Logic by John Stuart Mill